They shall be my finest warriors, these men who give of themselves to me. Like clay I shall mold them, and in the furnace of war I shall forge them. They shall be of iron will and steely sinew. In great armor I shall clad them, and with the mightiest weapons shall they be armed. They will be untouched by plague or disease. No sickness shall blight them. They shall have such tactics, strategies, and machines that no foe will best them in battle. They are my bulwark against the terror. They are the defenders of humanity. They are my space marines. And they shall know no fear. The Space Marines, or Adeptus Astarts, are foremost amongst the defenders of humanity, the greatest of the Emperor of Mankind's warriors. They are barely human at all, but superhuman, having been made superior in all respects to a normal man by a harsh regime of genetic modification, psycho-conditioning, and rigorous training. Space Marines are untouched by plague or any natural disease and can suffer wounds that would kill a lesser being several times over and live to fight again. Clad in ancient power armor and wielding the most potent weapons known to man, the Space Marines are terrifying foes and their devotion to the Emperor and the Imperium of Man is unyielding. They are the God Emperor's angels of death and they know no fear. The Astarts are physically stronger, far more resilient, and often mentally far removed from the lot of most normal human beings. In the presence of the Astarts, most people feel a combination of awe and fear, and many cultures on the more primitive worlds simply worship them outright as demigods or angels of the god emperor made flesh. They should feel so, for many space marines feel little compassion for those they have sometimes termed mortals in comparison to themselves, seeing the very people they were created to protect as little more than obstacles to a more efficient eradication of the Imperium's enemies. This is an attitude sometimes taken by whole chapters. They see normal humans as frail, weak creatures given to the follies of temptation, avarice, greed, lust and cowardice, all emotions they rarely feel, if ever. Yet there are some astarts who remember why they were created by the Emperor, who avoid the trap of hubris which the space marines are so prone to and which has seduced so many of their number to serve the ruinous powers of chaos. They are the final guardians of mankind, the saviors of last resort. They were intended not to lead humanity, but to defend it, sometimes even from itself. At the heart of that mission lies the limitless compassion the Emperor extended to every man and woman in the galaxy when he willingly chose to condemn himself to more than 10,000 years of imprisonment within a dying prison of flesh for their sake. Some Astarts sneer at compassion, seeing it as one more human weakness that has been purged from their superior transhuman bodies and minds. But the wisest of the Space Marines know that in the end, compassion is their only salvation. Potential Space Marines are usually, but not always, recruited from the worlds where a chapter has established its fortress monastery, although some chapters are known to recruit from a collection of different worlds in an area of space that they protect or frequent. Recruiting methods vary from chapter to chapter. Some select their neophytes from feral tribes roaming the surface of inhospitable worlds, while others draw upon eager volunteers who have been groomed from birth to become an Astartes. Still others watch and kidnap potential warriors, turning them into Astartes whether they will it or not. Whatever the method, all Space Marine chapters will only accept those who successfully pass the grueling initiation trials and prove themselves worthy of becoming a Space Marine. However a man becomes a space meringue does not matter. Once his body has been forged into that of a transhuman astartes, he must forever stand apart from the people to whom he was once kin and who he is now sworn to protect. Once a man becomes a space meringue, he is no longer mortal. His genetic heritage is now that of the emperor himself, and a spark of the same divine majesty flows in his veins. There are approximately 1,000 space marine chapters active in the Imperium of Man at any one time. Since the opening of the Great Rift in the era Indomitus, these chapters have been comprised of a mixture of traditional firstborn space marines and the even more enhanced Primaris space marines, all may contain only Primaris marines. A list of the most notable and well-known chapters in the Imperium can be found here. This number has stayed relatively constant since the second founding in the 31st millennium, following the Horus Heresy, when the first founding space marine legions were broken up. 
However, the exact population of astars in the galaxy remains far from exact and may fluctuate widely depending on the time period and the circumstances confronting the Imperium. The Space Marines are the Imperium of Man's supreme, transhuman warriors. Genetically enhanced to be the ultimate soldiers of mankind, they are far stronger and more resilient than ordinary human beings. Space Marines are organized into roughly a thousand chapters, with each chapter numbering approximately 1,000 warriors organized into 10 companies of 100 troops each. Each chapter is a self-sufficient Imperial Army, equipped with its own spacecraft and capable of responding at a moment's notice to any threat to the security of the Imperium. Every chapter is fiercely proud of its history and achievements, and each one has its own distinctive colors and heraldic markings. These were established at the chapter's founding and are displayed with pride upon all of its armor and vehicles. All of the warrior of the Space Marines is painstakingly maintained, and many items are covered in lines of intricately rendered devotional script in High Gothic, each line detailing a battle honor won in a glorious campaign. A Space Marine is a towering transhuman warrior, his brute strength tempered by inhuman skill. He is armed with the fearsome Bolter, a blessed weapon that fires devastating, mass-reactive shells that explode within the flesh of the target. He is protected by a suit of power armor, shielding him from the fiercest of enemy fire whilst simultaneously strengthening his blows and allowing him to survive the most hostile of environments. He is the product of intensive training and genetic manipulation, which transforms mortal men selected from the deadliest warrior races in the gnome galaxy into the most lethal of superhuman killing machines in mankind's arsenal. The Space Marines can trace their origins back to the Unification Wars on Terra in the late 30th millennium, when the Emperor of Mankind first revealed his existence and led regiments of deadly genetically engineered soldiers known as Thunder Warriors in a great campaign to unite all of the myriad techno-barbarian tribes and nation-states of Old Earth under his rule. From the outset of his retaking of Terra, the Emperor employed genetically modified warriors within his forces and in these early enhanced troops lay the origins of what would later become the Space Marine Legions. During the Age of Strife, known as Old Night on Terra, the Cradle of Mankind had seen more than its fair share of augments and super-soldiers created both from the bioalchemy of genetic engineering and cybernetic augmentation. But it was the Emperor's own Thunder Warriors, named for the early Thunderbolt and Raptor's head heraldry used by their master in the Imperium's earliest days, that were to prove superior to all of them. These superhuman warriors were a gestalt mix of unprecedented superhuman physical power, gene-programmed resistance to environmental and even psychic attack, a warlike spirit, and the Emperor's own strategic genius. The Thunder Regiments were an army unlike any that had come before them, and the forces of the powerful tyrants of Old Earth had nothing to match them. This unification of humanity's homeworld marked the beginning of the Imperium of Man and the Emperor's quest to reunite all of humanity under a single interstellar government. This quest was intended to prevent his species' extinction from the growing threats which confronted the human-settled galaxy in the wake of the Age of Strife. But despite their many early victories in the Unification Wars, the Thunder Warriors were far from perfect. Some were mentally unstable, Others suffered catastrophic biological failure after an unprecedented span of years as their own superhuman physiques turning against them in the end. It seems obvious in retrospect that the Emperor knew early on that a more permanent and stable force of genetically enhanced warriors was needed, so even while the Thunder Warriors waged war in their early days, the Emperor gathered about him a team of servants and gene rights, some willing and others as captives taken from his foes, and constructed new genetics laboratories deep in the vast dungeons of the former Sigilite fortress he had taken on his own beneath the Himalayan Himalayan mountains. Labor there went on for solar decades in absolute secrecy and resulted in the creation of the Primarchs and other wonders of genecraft known and unknown. Foremost amongst these were the Space Marine Legions, the Legions Astartes. Into their creation went all the secret history and genetic lore of the Age of Strife, Hard wisdom gained through the success and failure of the Thunder Warriors and the Emperor's own unparalleled genius.
The first among the Space Marines were hand-picked men drawn from the Emperor's personal bodyguard. These volunteers were subjected to surgical, genetic, and psychological modification. With rigorous training and appropriate mental conditioning, they became not only immensely strong and tough, but iron-willed and disciplined, no longer prone to the psychological damage that normally affected humans facing the stress of constant combat. They were an unstoppable force whose loyalty to the Emperor was unflinching. Quickly the process was refined and systematized, and the numbers of the new enhanced warriors, at first armed and armored as the Thunder Warriors had been, grew swiftly. The first Astarts were organized into twenty distinct regiments numbering no more than a few hundred warriors each. Although it remained a dire secret at the time, it is now widely believed that this division was more than a merely administrative one, as each regiment contained variant gene seed encoding drawn from a different primogenitor primarch. This often manifested its influence in subtle and unexpected ways, not least of all in influencing the psychological character of the genetically enhanced warriors. With the regiments expanding rapidly into full legions with the intake of new blood from the areas of Terra that had already joined cause with the Emperor, the new warriors quickly eclipsed and replaced the mighty but far less disciplined and mentally unstable Thunder Warriors. As the Proto-Space Marine Legions were unleashed in the latter days of the Unification Wars, victory followed victory in quick succession. As time went on, the Space Marine regiments became legions as the Emperor recruited young men from amongst the newly conquered tribes of Old Earth and the hundreds of Astarts in service to the Imperium swiftly became tens of thousands. These superhuman troops dominated the final days of the Wars of Unification, easily defeating all their Terran opponents and forcing those among the tech priests of Mars who had intervened in the conflict on Terra to delay the Emperor's victory to sue for peace. But in truth, the victories of the early Space Marines created a new problem within the Imperial Fold. The Emperor had been right to be worried about his earlier creations, the Thunder Warriors. One ancient source claims that even before the Unification Wars had ended, the Thunder Warriors, already jealous of their replacements' long lives, at last realized that their creator had cursed them with short lifespans as a result of their imperfect genetic augmentations. In their rage and fear, they turned upon him for what they saw as his betrayal. It was a caterer of several hundred custodians of the Legio Custodes, the Emperor's bodyguard, even then believed to have been led by the legendary Constantin Valda and accompanied by several thousand prototype Estarts of the I Legion of the Newborn Space Marines that stood in the Emperor's defense, carrying out a merciless culling of the obsolete and rebellious Jean soldiers. Despite such tragedies, the Space Marines fought with righteous zeal, and it was they who first referred to their mission as a crusade, by their efforts, for the first time in unrecorded millennia, the Earth was united under the rule of one man. The armor they wore was not new, but the same partially powered armor that had evolved on old Earth and was worn by the elite of both the Emperor's armies and the techno-barbarian tribes that had fought against him. Some of this Thunder armor, first named for the Thunder regiments that were the Legion's forebears, was newly forged, but the Emperor's warsmiths also took or cannibalized many suits from the armories and corpses of conquered foes. As if to mark a break from the wars of the past, the armor of the first Astartes was cast in storm cloud gray and bore only the thunderbolt and lightning marks of imperial unity. Over time, the Space Marine Legions gained their own marks of distinction and character. Names, Emperor given in some cases, others by the Primarchs, came to replace the Legion's original numbers, with many Space Marine companies seeking to single themselves out from their brother Legions. Battle honors were accumulated and the effect of each Legion's character worked upon them, so that as the Legions expanded to conquer the galaxy, Storm Cloud Grey became granite, silver, viridian, sable, gold, ocean, ash or ice, and by the time of the triumph of Olena, the Grey Legions of the Unification Era were gone, lost to history. Of the 1,000 or more Space Marine chapters thought to be in existence at the present time, a blessed few can trace their beginnings back to an age more than 10,000 standard years ago in the late 30th millennium when the Emperor of Mankind still walked amongst mortals. In those days, the Emperor first created the Primarchs, 20 immortal superhumans blessed with extraordinary intelligence, charisma, and sheer physical might who were to be his proconsuls, 
generals and closest comrades during the Great Crusade to reunite the scattered and long isolated human colony worlds after the end of the Age of Strife. The Primarchs wielded powers the like of which are not known in the Imperium today, yet they were lost to the warp in an accident deep within the Emperor's gene laboratories beneath the fortress that would become the Imperial Palace. They were were scattered, still in their gestation capsules, through the Immaterium to worlds across the galaxy by the will of the Dark Gods of Chaos. The first space marines of the nascent Imperium were also the creation of that era, each made using the genetic inheritance of one of the Primarchs, albeit diluted a hundred times, for no merely human body could contain such power. As each of the Primarchs were encountered in turn by Imperial expeditionary fleets during the progress of the Great Crusade, they became the natural and obvious leader of the Space Marine Legion created from their genetic material and with whom they had so much in common. In many cases, the Primarch's adopted world became the new base of operations for their legion and was known henceforth as that legion's homeworld. The Primarchs then recruited their loyal followers from each of these world's peoples into the ranks of their legion, while others were given rights to draw fresh blood from suitable warlike worlds that were liberated as the Great Crusade progressed. With the rediscovery of the Primarchs, and in many cases newly adopted homeworlds used as legion fiefs, most commonly the worlds upon which a legion's new master had been found, this was to change the character and culture of the original legions profoundly. Some alterations were superficial, a habit of speech, a change in close-quarter tactics, martial traditions, and warranted additions to iconography and even language. But for others the change would prove dramatic, with entire paradigms of culture, tradition, and even ideology overriding what had come before, such as in what came to be known as the Space Wolves and Dark Angels Legions. In many cases, the stamp of the legions and the will of the Primarchs on their recruits came to largely outweigh differences of birth or blood. But in other legions, such as the Lunar Wolves and the Emperor's Children, a subtle divide would grow between those veterans born on Terra, who had been recruited into the ranks of the Astarts by the Emperor, and those who had come into the legion from their Primarch's homeworld. This cultural rift would be one factor among many that would lead several of the first founding legions towards ultimate damnation. The names of many of the Primarchs still echo down the millennia, and the tales of their deeds are legendary. Names such as Lion L. Johnson, Lemon Russ, Rogel Dawn, Vulcan, Corax, and the angel-winged Sanguinius are spoken of with awe on those worlds where mankind dwells. They commend a reverence second only to that afforded the Emperor himself. Other names are cursed wherever men gather, for many of the Primarchs rebelled against the Emperor and followed Horus, mightiest of their number, when he raised his standard against mankind on behalf of Chaos. As the Great Crusade continued the expansion of the nascent Imperium into the galaxy, the discovery of the Primarchs and their newly adopted homeworlds helped to stem an impending crisis that was not widely known of at the time outside of the exalted ranks of the Imperium's ruling War Council. Namely, the diminishing stability of the gene seed itself through overuse and the increasing need for ever greater numbers of space marines in the field. This was a matter that only worsened as the Great Crusade pushed ever wider afield into the galaxy. Imperial forces could no longer be concentrated as easily as before, and attrition was taking its toll as years of near-constant battle became solar decades. To relent the pace of the Great Crusade's progress was for the Emperor simply not an option, and so the simple truth was that more space marines were needed, and they needed to be created faster than before. A secret conclave of gene rights under the Emperor's direct supervision posited the solution that became known as Grubius Theorem, which demonstrated that a Primarch's genetic code could be used to stabilize and expand Astart's gene seed stocks with what was hoped to be minimal deviation. Alongside this accelerated gene culturing technique, other previously unavailable genetic technologies, many taken from the Selenar gene cults of Luna, were put into effect, reducing the processing time required to create a battle-worthy space moraine to a single Terran year in some cases. Such accelerated gene C techniques, along with absent, inadequate, or overforceful psycho-indoctrination techniques, were later found to have unseen fundamental flaws. 
many Imperial savants since have come to believe that the drive to create larger space marine legions at accelerated speed played a prime role in the degradation of the sanity and psychological makeup of certain legions and paved the way for the horror that was to come. At the very height of the Emperor's Great Crusade, the traitorous Warmaster Horus led his traitor legions of Chaos Space Marines against those who stood loyal at the Emperor's side. Hundreds of worlds burned in the name of the Dark Gods, and a terror unlike any seen before was unleashed across the galaxy during the seven dark standard years that the heresy raged after the first battles in the Istvan system. Much of the truth of these times has been lost, obscured by the mists of time or embellished to the point where giants bestrode worlds with thunderous steps and the planets themselves cracked and split at their tread. The traitor forces of Horus drove all before them until those Astarte's legions still loyal to the master of mankind stood at bay upon the fortified walls of the imperial palace during the climactic siege of Terra. The forces of darkness pressed in around the guttering flame of humanity, but desperate times called for desperate solutions. Sanguinius of the Blood Angels and Rogel Dawn of the Imperial Fists, together with their bravest warriors, decided to accompany the Emperor and take the fight to Horus upon his battle barge, the Vengeful Spirit, a mighty Gloriana-class battleship in orbit above Terra. The Emperor and his warriors teleported onto Horus' flagship but found themselves separated and scattered throughout the corrupt vessel by means of the Warmaster's dark sorcery. The Emperor fought his way to the Warmaster but was too late to save Sanguinius, who Horus slew when the angelic Primarch refused to turn to chaos. Yet, some maintain that Sanguinius inflicted a wound, however small, upon his erstwhile brother. Horus and the Emperor clashed in a battle of both flesh and spirit, Horus was filled with the power of the ruinous powers and dealt the Emperor a mortal blow, but in the end, the Emperor's will was the greater and Horus was struck down with the last ounce of the Emperor's strength. The Archtraitor was destroyed utterly, in body and soul, and with his death, the power of the traitor legions was broken. When Dawn and his warriors finally fought their way into the rebel Warmaster's sanctum, they found the Emperor's broken and ruined body, and it is said that their cries of woe were heard far below on Terra itself. Rogel Dawn, most determined and unbending of the Primarchs, bore his master's body back to Terra, and under the direction of the crippled Emperor, bound him within the strange psychic augmentation device known as the Golden Throne to sustain his existence for all eternity with constant sacrifice and Baroque machineries. The followers of the ruinous powers were defeated, but it was victory won at a terrible cost. The Brotherhood of the Primarchs was sundered, and the Emperor's vision for the Imperium and all of mankind lay in ruins, the last, best hope of a new golden age for humanity lost forever. The galactic empire for humanity the Emperor had forged was all but destroyed, and it was to take many more standard years of brutal warfare during the Great Scouring before all the traitor forces were defeated and driven into the hellish chaos of the Eye of Terror. The death toll numbered in the billions, and uncounted worlds had been left as little more than corpse haunted wastelands as the raging inferno of what Imperial savants later named the Horus Heresy was finally extinguished, though mankind still teetered on the very brink of extinction. The heresy had revealed weaknesses in the gene seed of several of the early space marine legions, which had been exacerbated by the need to keep the huge formations up to strength in the terrible wars being fought during the Great Crusade. The insidious powers of Chaos had been able to manipulate this corruption to turn Horus and many of the space marines under his command against the Emperor. Once Horus was defeated, it was decided by Robab Gilliman, the Primarch of the Ultramarines Legion who became the day-to-day -day ruler of the Imperium, that the forces of the Imperium would be reorganized so that a similar catastrophe could not be repeated. The Space Marine Legions were divided up to create one chapter of the same name as the Founding Legion and a number of new chapters with new names. This critical event of the early 31st millennium was called the Second Founding, and over two dozen further foundings have occurred in the 10 millennia since. It is not known exactly how many chapters were created in the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, as many of the Imperium's records are understandably incomplete or lost entirely, and whole chapters have been created and destroyed in the millennia that have followed. What is known is that there are just over a thousand chapters scattered across the Imperium, 
each a brotherhood of the very finest warriors humanity has ever called to its service. In the wake of the calamity that was the Horus heresy, the foundations of the present-day Imperium were laid down during a period remembered as the Reformation. The first High Lords of Terror established, under the direction of Gilliman, the structure by which the Adeptus Terror operated and described the feudal responsibilities and duties of the planetary governors. One of the most important accomplishments was the reorganization of the Imperium's military forces. This was undertaken almost single-handedly by Robert Gulliman, who in his role as the post-heresy Lord Commander of the Imperium, moved with his characteristic speed and efficiency to codify the structure of the Astra Militarum, the Imperial Navy, and the Space Marines. With the threat of the trade allegiance held at bay in the wake of the Horus Heresy and the Great Scouring, Robert Gulliman turned to ensuring that such a catastrophe could never happen again. He distilled his formidable wisdom into a mighty tome known as the Codex Astartes. This text became a major part of his legacy and the cornerstone upon which the future of the Imperium would be based. Of all Gilliman's works, the most influential would prove to be the Codex Astartes, the great prescriptive tome that lays down the basic organizational and tactical rules for a space marine chapter. The Codex Astartes decreed that space marines would be created and trained over a controlled period of time. Of special interest is the volume of the Codex that described in detail the tactical roles, equipment specifications, uniform markings, command protocols, and countless other aspects of space marine doctrine. Though for all its multitudinous topics, the most lasting and contentious decree of the Codex Astartes was that the existing space marine legions be broken up and reorganized into smaller organizations known as chapters. Though many of his brother Primarchs initially railed against Gilliman's decree, almost all eventually accepted the necessity of reorganization for the security of the Imperium. Thus were the chapters of the Adeptus Astartes born. Upon the Codex Astartes implementation, in an event that would become known as the Second Founding, each of the old legions became a single chapter of 1000 Astartes named for its phobia, plus a number of other new chapters. In addition to a name and heraldry of their own, each of these new chapters would take for itself a homeworld or fortress monastery, and use it as a bastion from which to defend the Imperium from all threats. The Codex Astartes stated that each chapter would be 1000 Battle Brothers strong and look to its own recruitment, training, and equipment. Never again would one man be able to command the awesome, terrifying power of a space marine legion. The Horus Heresy had also revealed the inherent weaknesses of the gene seed of several space marine legions. These defects had been exacerbated by the accelerated gene seed cultivation techniques needed to keep the huge space marine legions up to strength. Grilliman believed that the Chaos powers were able to exploit the resultant physical and mental corruption to turn Horus troops against the Emperor. One of the key objectives of the Codex Astartes was to recognize and expunge these genetic weaknesses. As a result, the Codex decreed that space marines would forevermore be created and trained slowly. The gene banks used to create Astartes implants would be carefully monitored and scrutinized for any defects. Cultivated organs would be subject to the most stringent tests of genetic purity. Young aspirants would undergo trials of suitability before they were accepted, and only those of the very sternest character would be chosen. As a final safeguard, Gilliman tasked the Adeptus Terra on Earth with setting up and maintaining gene banks to produce and store teats of space marine gene seed. These banks were to provide all new gene seed for subsequent foundings of space marine chapters. To prevent cross-contamination, the genetic stock of each legion was isolated whilst that of the traitor legions was placed under a time-locked stasis seal, though at the time many believed they had been destroyed. By taking direct control of these genetic tithes, the Adeptus Terra could ultimately control the Space Marines. They alone had the power to destroy or create Space Marine armies at will. Over the millennia, there have been many subsequent foundings of Space Marine chapters. Many chapters adhere rigidly to Gilliman's teachings. These space marines pride themselves on following the tenets within the hallowed pages of the Codex Astartes and applying its principles of warcraft and devotion to the Emperor.
With the passage of centuries, some chapters have strayed from the strict letter of the Codex, introducing unique variations on its teachings but remaining broadly faithful to Gilliman's basic principles. Furthermore, the Codex has been reanalyzed, reinterpreted, and modified countless times over the centuries. Indeed, the Codex Astartes of the late 41st millennium is a highly developed treatise combining the experiences of hundreds of celebrated military thinkers throughout history. Regardless, the Codex Astartes remains, as it has always been, the Space Marine's authoritative guide to waging war. As such, it is revered by every battle brother as a holy text, the wisdom of the ancients serving as both scripture and the unbending road by which they are measured. Most chapters stick rigidly to the organization laid down by the Codex Astartes for tactical roles and other processes. Others, such as the Blood Angels, Black Templars and Dark Angels, are organized according to general Codex doctrines but maintain troops, tactics and idiosyncratic traditions that set them apart from their brethren. A small number of chapters are utterly different from the Codex and owe nothing to it at all. The most famous of these is the Space Wolves. The sons of Lim and Rust have never followed the Codex Astartes. Their strong-willed Primarch molded his chapter very much in his own image, irrespective of other influences and dictates. The second founding of the Space Marines was decreed seven Terran years after the death of Horus. The existing Space Marine legions were broken down and refounded as smaller, more flexible formations. Where the old legions were unlimited in size, the new formations were fixed at approximately 1,000 astats. This corresponded to the existing astats unit within some legions called the Chapter, and in future the Chapter was recognized as the standard autonomous space marine formation. No longer would one man have power over a force as powerful as a space marine legion, the existing space marine legions were divided into new chapters. One chapter kept the name, badge, and colors of the original legion, while the remaining chapters took on new titles, badges, and colors. Most of the old legions were divided into fewer than five chapters, but the ultramarines, being by far the largest of the legions, were divided many times. The exact number of new chapters created from the ultramarines is uncertain. The number listed in the oldest known copy of the Codex Astartes, the so-called Apocrypha of Scaros, gives the total as 23, but does not name them. As a result of the second founding, the Ultramarine's gene seed became the favored genetic stock of most subsequent Astartes foundings. The new chapters created from the Ultramarines are often referred to as the Primogenitors, or the Firstborn. All of the Primogenitor chapters venerate Robert Gilliman as their founding father and patron, the Codex Astartes further defines the tactical roles, equipment specifications, and uniform identification markings of the Space Marines. Some of its contents seem petty and restrictive, hardly worthy of the great mind of a Primarch. Others describe actual battles together with comments on the tactics employed and the decisions of the commanders of the day. As such, the Codex is revered as a holy text of the imperial cult, and many chapters regard its recommendations as sanctified by the emperor himself. The chapters that rigidly follow the word of the Codex Astartes are sometimes referred to as Codex Chapters or Codex Astartes Compliant Chapters. These space marines adhere to the Codex as the model for their organization, identification markings, and tactical doctrine. Of all of the Codex chapters, the most famous is the Ultramarines, the chapter of Robert Gilliman himself. The Adeptus Terra has never decreed it necessary to enforce the Codex absolutely. Indeed, it is doubtful whether it could if it so chose. However, with subsequent foundings, they have always favored the Ultramarines' gene seed and created many new Codex chapters from that genetic line. With the passage of time, some of these chapters have subsequently strayed from the strict letter of the Codex, introducing new variations on their organization or tactical doctrine, but remaining broadly faithful to the principles laid down by Robert Gilliman many millennia before. The history of the Imperium since the Horus Heresy is not a continuous story. There have been periods of rebellion and anarchy, times when the balance of power has suddenly changed and history has quite literally been rewritten. Many of the subsequent foundings of Space Marine chapters belong to these troubled times, making it almost impossible to ascertain when some chapters have been created. 
it is believed that of the 1,000 or more chapters thought to be in existence today, more than a third have descended from the ultramarines, either directly or through one of their primogenitor chapters of the second founding. It is not known how many new chapters were created by the second founding. Many records were lost during the Age of Apostasy, a troubled time in the 36th millennium that bestrides the history of the Imperium like an impenetrable wall. In all likelihood, some of the chapters created during the second founding have since been destroyed, leaving no records of the deeds. Others have been lost in more recent times, and their names are now all that remains of them. On many occasions in the Imperium's history, there have been long periods of rebellion and anarchy, times when the balance of power has suddenly changed and history been lost or rewritten. Many later foundings of space marines were born of such troubled times, making it impossible to ascertain when they were created, their origins ever shrouded in mystery. All that is known for sure is that there are approximately a thousand chapters of the Adeptus Astarts today, perhaps less than one space marine for every planet in the Imperium. That the space marines are equal to the task of safeguarding mankind against such impossible odds is testament to their dedication and skill in battle. It can be said that there are three main categories of space marine chapters. The first and largest group are the Shins of Gilliman, those chapters descended from the Ultramarines and their primogenitors. The primogenitors are those chapters created when the old Ultramarines Legion was divided during the second founding. Sometimes referred to as the firstborn, these chapters each maintain their own histories and traditions, but they all honor Robat Gilliman as their primarch and adhere strictly to the procedures and tactical treatises he laid down in the Codex Astartes. These chapters maintain their own traditions, for the Codex Astartes insists that each should have its own name, badge, and heraldry. Nonetheless, they honor Robab Gilliman as their primarch and his successor, the ruler of Ultramar, as their distant liege. Should the Lord of Ultramar ever need aid, he will find these chapters ever willing to fight at his side. The chapters in the second largest category owe their genetic inheritance to another Primarch, but follow the Codex Estarts as closely as their divergent genetic heritage allows. While primarily made up of successor chapters, such as the Crimson Fists and Brazen Claws, this group also includes several chapters from the first founding, most notably the White Scars, Imperial Fists, Iron Hands, and Raven Guard. While they still venerate their own Primarchs, they nevertheless also aspire to the high standards and wise teachings that Robert Gilliman put down in the Codex Astartes. The final group is more wildly aberrant. These chapters, by virtue of a gene seed quirk, the teachings of their own Primarch, or even sheer stubbornness, eschew the Codex Astartes in favor of their own structural and combat doctrines. The Black Templars and Space Wolves are amongst this group, remaining fiercely independent and looking to their own divergent beliefs and ways of war. The Space Marines were originally divided into 20 large legions created during the first founding by the Emperor, and each legion was filled with thousands of Space Marines whose gene seed was based on genetic material drawn from one of the original Primarchs. When 18 of the 20 original Primarchs were rediscovered during the Great Crusade, they became the commanders of the Legion genetically related to them. During the Horus Heresy half of the Legions turned traitor to the Imperium and swore themselves to the ruinous powers of Chaos, becoming the nine traitor legions of Chaos Space Marines. Loyalist Legions Those Astartes Legions that remained loyal to the Emperor during the Horus Heresy were known as the Loyalists. They were subsequently each split up into smaller chapters of only 1,000 Space Marines each during the so-called Second Founding, one of which retained the name of the original Space Marine Legion. There are two missing First Founding Space Marine Legions, the Eimd and Exife Legions who, for unknown reasons, were deliberately expunged from all known Imperial records and archives before the onset of the Horus Heresy in the early 31st millennium. Referred to as the Forgotten and the Purged, it is known only that the missing Primarchs and their legions are listed as having been deleted from Imperial records. This formal censure and erasure from official records is known as an Edict of Obliteration, also called a Damnatio Memorina, a high Gothic phrase meaning condemnation of memory. 
This is the official imperial policy of deliberately destroying any records, icons, or other symbols or monuments pertaining to an individual or organization, usually of the imperial elite, who has been declared excommunicate traitorous by the emperor of mankind himself. In a galaxy-spanning empire that stressed fealty and loyalty to the emperor in return for advancement, acclaim, and spiritual salvation for its elates, this is perhaps one of the most severe punishments. The complete and utter erasure of all records of the Eind and Exith legions is considered by imperial historians as the most successful edict of obliteration ever carried out in imperial history. Given the current authoritarian nature of the Imperium, it seems likely these legions were completely removed from all historical records for being participants in or affected by some sort of catastrophe, such as a mass mutation event which couldn't be controlled, turning to the worship of the Chaos Gods earlier than the other traitor legions, etc. After the Horus Heresy, it was determined that the Space Marine Legions were too powerful and dangerous to the stability of the Imperium to be controlled by any one man. In what is known as the Second Founding, the remaining Loyalist Legions were broken up into the separate 1,000-man chapters, which remain the primary organization of the Adeptus Astartes to this day. In the 25 subsequent successor foundings that have occurred since the second founding, the Imperium has created many new chapters of space marines, using gene seeds sampled by the Adeptus Mechanicus from the existing ones. Many of these successor chapters still keep the memory of their progenitor legion or chapter alive in their rituals and regalia, and maintain the same methods of operation and battle, as well as their overall defining cultural and genetic traits. For a list of all the known Space Marine chapters, please see the list of Space Marine chapters. The Primaris Space Marines are a new breed of transhuman warriors developed across the span of 10,000 standard years by Archmagos Dominus Belisarius Call on Mars on the order of Primarch Robert Quilliman. Call used the genetic template of the original Space Marines created by the Emperor for his Great Crusade as the starting point for the development of the new Astartes soon after the second founding in the early 31st millennium. Primary Space Marines are bigger, more physically powerful, and possess faster reaction times than their original Astartes counterparts. For 10 millennia, Archmagos Dominus Belisarius Call has been working on a task set for him by the Primarch Robert Gilliman before he was mortally wounded by the Daemon Primarch Fulgrim in the days after the Horus Heresy, a new legion of transhuman warriors. Developed on orders from Gilliman 100 standard centuries past, Primaris Space Marines were diligently developed and perfected by the priesthood of Mars during the long intervening millennia. As an optimist, but never a fool, Gilliman learned from the mistakes of the Horus Heresy, and he foresaw that the forces of Chaos would never relent in their aim to bring the Imperium low. He anticipated that devastating times would once again engulf the galaxy and knew that warriors resilient enough to stand against them would be needed as never before. That time has surely come. Now, as the Imperium of Man is poised on the brink of annihilation at the hands of Chaos, his task is at last complete. The Primaris Space Moraine is a new generation of hero for this, the darkest age in the Imperium's history. These warriors are the next step in the evolution of the Emperor's Angels of Death, genetically altered from their brethren, now called the Firstborn, to be bigger, stronger and faster, timely reinforcements for the Imperium's armies as their enemies close in for the kill in the wake of Abaddon, the Despoilers' 13th Black Crusade, and the birth of the Great Rift dividing the Imperium in two. To aid them in battle, these gene-forged warriors are equipped with new arms and armor forged on Mars itself, such as the Mark X Tacticus Pattern Power Armor worn by the Primaris Space Marine Intercessors, which combines the most effective elements of ancestral Horist heresy patterns of battle plate with more recent developments in power armor technology. They are outfitted with the Mark O Call Pattern Bolt Rifle, the archetypal firearm of the Adeptus Astartes, now re-engineered, recrafted, and perfected. The Mark IE Belisarius Pattern Plasma Incinerator, a new refined plasma gun, Redemptor Dreadnoughts, the Overlord Gunship, and Repulsor Grav Tanks. At the dawn of the Indomitus Crusade, to retake the Imperium from the advancing armies of Chaos and Xenos alike, Lord Commander of the Imperium Robert Gilliman has gathered his new armada, 
along with elements of the Adeptus Custodes, a small contingent of the Silent Sisterhood, and a vast war host of Primaris Space Marines as he fights to liberate the scattered bastions of the Imperium. Sun Gilliman has forged into new Space Marine chapters, whole brotherhoods comprised only of these new transhuman warriors. Others he has offered to, to the existing Firstborn Space Marine chapters. Many Firstborn Chapter Masters have welcomed their Primaris brethren into their ranks, accepting the new reinforcements gladly. Others, though, view these new creations with suspicion or outright hostility, claiming that the Emperor's work should never have been meddled with by mere mortals. The newly reinstated Lord Commander of the Imperium decreed that those chapters most devastated by the ongoing wars would be amongst the first to be reinforced with this new breed of transhuman warrior. Starting with the Ultramarines, but also deploying these new Space Marines to every other chapter in need, Gilliman aimed to reinforce the Imperium's scattered defenders across the galaxy. It is not just as reinforcements to existing chapters, though. Gilliman also ordered the creation of a host of new chapters, the so-called Ultima Founding, composed entirely of Primaris Space Marines. The warriors of these new chapters were created entirely using the new processes discovered by Archmagos Belisarius Call and established with all the necessary weapons, armor, and equipment that they will need to conduct their defense of the Imperium. These chapters still trace their genetic lineage back to the gene seed of the first founding, and shins of all nine loyalist space marine legions emerged from the stasis vaults beneath the Red Planet. They benefit from three additional gene seed organs, larger size, better reflexes, and greater resiliency, but it still remains to be seen if Cole was able to successfully stabilize any of the known genetic deviations or impart any additional resistance to the effects of chaos. Many of these new chapters have been assigned homeworlds on the edge of the Great Rift, the Imperium's new frontline in the war against chaos, though some have inherited the empty fortress monasteries of chapters that had been lost to the attrition of constant war. Many of these worlds face a continuous battle against the Daemons of the Warp, as well as an unpredictable mix of Chino's raiders, pirates, and invaders. Though they are a step removed from their firstborn brothers, the Primaris Space Marines still bear the gene seed of their Primarchs, and some dissenting voices worry how this new type of warrior will react with the known genetic quirks and flaws of some of the more unusual chapters, such as the Blood Angels and the Space Wolves. The Primaris Space Marines offer new hope to a besieged Imperium, but the future remains a dark and uncertain place. The Ultima founding in Kerr, 999, and 41 was the largest mobilization of newly created space marines in centuries. It saw thousands of Primaris space marines woken from stasis beneath the surface of Mars and hurled into the forefront of mankind's galactic war. Yet this was not the only route by which the Primaris marines joined the fight for the Emperor's realm. From beneath the sands of Mars came the Primaris warriors of the original Ultima founding, they were lights against a tide of darkness, their advent key to the survival of mankind after the birth of the Great Rift, but not to securing its future. The first Primaris space marines to march to war were those from Archmagos Belisarius Call's laboratories on Mars. Upon Robert Gilliman's belated return to Terra during the Terran Crusade, the resurrected Primarch ordered the fruits of Call's long labor unleashed. This initial wave of Primaris space marines emerged from over 10,000 standard years of stasis, fully psychologically indoctrinated to each fulfill a single strategic role. Some were intercessors, some aggressors and so forth, and almost all specialize only in that one area of combat. These warriors were able to immediately take up their frontline combat duties with the expertise of veterans, and all possessed a modicum of additional skill with machine spirits thanks to their Martian heritage. Yet ultimately, they were somewhat strategically inflexible, for they had not undergone the grueling progression through their existing chapters' companies, or gained the wealth of experience that progress bestowed. Some of these Martian Primaris Marines formed entirely new chapters, such as the Rift Stalkers or the Silver Templars. The rest joined the Indomitus Crusade as Grey Shields, fighting together with the shins of other chapters and Primarchs as part of the force known as the Unnumbered Sons until the Indomitus Crusade fleets reached their adoptive homeworld or the fleet of the firstborn chapters that they were destined to join. 
Each time such a momentous occasion came, another caterer of Battle Brothers would peel off and reinforce the chapter whose colors they wore and whose genetic heritage they shared. Not all of these Premaris reinforcements had an easy time integrating with their erstwhile firstborn brothers, but ultimately all brought fresh strength to the Space Marine chapters fighting furiously against the tide of horrors vomited from the Great Rift. In every fortress monastery and upon every fleet-based chapter's flagship, the machineries of a grim and bloody future were installed and awoken. From these engines of Genesis would fresh waves of Primaris initiates arise, their task to fight for the Emperor's realm. The first wave of Ultima founding Primaris space marines proved invaluable reinforcements for their parent chapters. Yet in the ongoing war for humanity's survival in the era Indomitus, a single influx of fresh strength would never be enough. This is why, along with warriors, the Indomitus Crusade fleets included Adeptus Mechanicus Genita Acolytes, who integrated themselves with each already existing chapter's Apothecarian. It was these Acolytes and their arcane machines that enabled the Adeptus Astarts to recruit and train new Primaris space marines within their existing chapters. Not every chapter of Firstborn Marines welcomed these new arrivals. The Adeptus Mechanicus is an acquisitive and controlling organization known to be unscrupulous in its pursuit of power. Chapters such as the Dark Angels, the Space Wolves and the Mortifactors are notoriously insular of culture, and some guard dark secrets they would risk much to keep out of the manipulative tech priests' databanks. However, none could deny that being able to recruit and train fresh waves of Primaris space marines provided the Adeptus Astarts with a long-term, sustainable wellspring of martial might. So the process began. Some chapters implanted all of their aspirants with the full suite of Primaris organs, while others gifted only a proportion of their novitiates in this fashion, leaving the others to develop as firstborn Astarts. These newly conditioned battle brothers benefited not only from the strength of their Primaris enhancement, but also from the tactical versatility imparted by a full and rounded progression through the ranks, coupled with all of the cultural and spiritual indoctrination required to properly initiate the neophytes into their chapter. No true son of the Primarchs could long look upon the might of the new Primaris brothers and not wish to take up that mantle of power for themselves. They sought this agonizing apotheosis not for personal glory, but because no true space moraine would refuse greater strength, resilience, and weaponry with which to protect the Imperium and slobber their many foes. The warriors of the Ultima founding had joined their parent chapters. The machineries developed by Balazaria's call had provided those chapters with waves of new Primaris recruits who had integrated into every level of the chapter's organization. For the Primaris-only chapters, this was an end to the matter. They stood proudly as defenders of the Imperium, recruiting from their own conquered fiefdoms and forging their own roles of honor as the years passed. Yet for those chapters who had come before, questions remained to be answered. Could a firstborn Moraine who had not been created primaries undergo the necessary gene therapies and invasive surgeries required to elevate him to that status? Could he gain the benefits of the enhanced primaris physique, and access the potent new warger that was theirs to wield. In short, could he cross the so-called Rubicon Primaris to become a yet greater living weapon in the Emperor's service, or would attempts to do so simply waste priceless astats lives at a time when the Imperium could ill afford to sacrifice its greatest defenders? Records differ as to who were the first space marines to take this perilous leap of faith. Some say it was Marnie's Kalga of the Ultramarines, or that it was Corsaro Khan, the White Scar's ferocious master of the hunt, who first made this painful transition. Other chapters make their own claims, or else lament the tragic loss of those who tried and failed to ascend. Yet despite the losses suffered, and the unspeakable agonies of undertaking the Primaris ascension, more battle brothers crossed the Rubicon with every passing day. New Space Marine chapters are not created piecemeal as required by the Imperium's strategic needs, but rather in deliberate groupings called foundings. The process by which a new foundings creation is approved by the Imperial government is mysterious and arcane, subject to decades or even centuries of planning before it is announced. 
It is only by an edict of the High Lords of Terror that such an undertaking as the creation of new chapters can be instigated, for it requires the cooperation and mobilization of countless divisions within the Imperium's monolithic and vast governmental organizations. Establishing new Astartes chapters on an individual basis is nigh impossible, the mobilization of such vast resources is beyond the ability of any single segment of the Imperium. The Adeptus Mechanicus plays an essential role in the process of a founding, for its highest echelons are tasked with creating, testing and developing the gene seed samples that will provide the genetic foundation of the new chapters. Entire forge worlds may be turned over to the manufacture of the mighty arsenal of weaponry, ammunition, power armor, vehicles and starships that any such force will require. There are a myriad of other concerns as well. A suitable homeworld inhabited by humans must be identified for the new chapter, which will likely provide not only a secure and defensible base of operations, but also a source of new recruits as well. Such worlds might have been reported by itinerant rogue traders and earmarked centuries before by Adeptus Mechanicus explorators as potential Astartes homeworlds. A degree of environmental terraforming might be required and the natives of the world, if they are to become the source of the new chapter's aspirants, must be studied and tested by the Mechanicus Megos biologists and genitors for many generations to ensure they are genetically pure and free of any strain of mutation that might later affect the chapter itself. The construction of a chapter's fortress monastery may be one of the greatest undertakings of all, drawing on the genius of the Imperium's most accomplished military architects and engineers. If the chapter is to be fleet-based, then even more work must be put into the construction of a massive chapter bark or an unusually large battle barge to serve as the chapter's mobile fortress monastery and all of the related capital warships and escorts such a highly mobile chapter will require. The already extant Space Marine chapters may also have a role in this process, though to what degree can vary greatly from founding to founding. Many of the first founding chapters maintain close links with chapters created using their own gene seed stocks, and the chapter masters might have a hand in planning future foundings using that genetic material. It is said that the Disciples of Caliban, a Dark Angel's successor chapter, was created following the direct appeal of the Supreme Grand Master of the Dark Angels, an extremely rare request. In the more than 10,000 standard years that have passed since the first founding of the 20 original Space Marine Legions by the Emperor, there have been 26 subsequent foundings of new chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, with the most recent, the Ultima founding of the Primaris Space Marines, occurring soon after the birth of the Great Rift. Even before a new founding is announced, entire generations of Imperial servants may have toiled in preparation. Even once the process has been declared and is underway, it is likely to be at least a standard century before the new chapters are ready to begin combat operations. In times of dire need for the Imperium, faster development has been attempted, but this has often resulted in disaster. Gene seed cultured in haste is likely to degrade or to mutate, and a great many other factors can lead the entire process astray. And there is no foe more dangerous to the Imperium of Man than a space moraine who has been corrupted by chaos or gone renegade for another reason. Each chapter of Space Marines has its own methods of recruiting young warriors to fill its ranks. Many are based on a single homeworld and recruit solely from that populace, setting trials and tests for prospective candidates to weed out all but the strongest and the most faithful. These worlds are often technologically backward with strong militaristic societies, where male children who show potential are pushed harder and harder that they may one day have a chance to join the ranks of the Space Marines, who are often known to such peoples as Star Warriors, Sky Knights, or similar names. Because feral worlds are rough, primitive, and untamed, their inhabitants invariably provide excellent recruits. For true aggression and nigh psychotic killer instinct, however, few recruits can best the murderous city scum that roam the darkest pits of the Imperium's many hive worlds. Driven to extremes of violence by the pressures of hive world living, these merciless killers are usually ignored by the authorities. They make ideal space marine recruits, and whole gangs of city scum are sometimes hunted down and made to undergo the trials. Some recruits are drawn from the more civilized worlds of the Imperium, but not very many. 
those planets used by the space marines as recruiting worlds are observed closely by the chapter's apothecaries and chaplains. The population's genetic purity must be maintained in order to conserve those qualities that serve the space marines' purposes best. Their spiritual health is also maintained to ensure that no trace of the influence of the ruinous powers becomes manifest. Such observations are in general carried out from a distance, and it is rare for the society to have any direct contact with, or knowledge of, the space marines, or in many cases even of the Imperium. The chapter's officers might visit the culture once a generation and will be the subject of myth and legend. These mighty warriors from beyond the stars are figures of awe, and their word is law. The nature of the trials set by the outsiders vary enormously, but all are so arduous that only a handful pass them. Those who fail may be lucky to even survive, for many trials take the form of ritual combat, the hunting of a great beast, or the performance of incredibly dangerous feats of strength and bravery. At the conclusion of the trials, those few aspirants that have been deemed worthy are taken away, invariably never to see their people again. It is always a great honor for a family to have a son chosen by the space marines, even for societies with little conception of the greater galaxy beyond their world. The space wolves are an example of this. The wolf priests of the space wolves scour the warring tribes of their homeworld Fenris for their strongest and bravest youths, while the ultramarines traditionally draw their candidates from the elite training barracks of a whole group of planetary systems known collectively as Ultramar, the realm of the ultramarines. Other chapters have no single homeworld and travel the galaxy in gigantic fleets of battleships, recruiting either from a regular series of worlds or from the war zones to which they are assigned. The Black Templars are one such example of a fleet-based chapter, as are the Dark Angels. Once accepted, the young aspirants become neophytes and begin their regimen of training and biological enhancement. Each chapter has its own traditions regarding the initiation of the recruit into its legends and secrets. This process often runs parallel to the biogenetic treatments the neophyte must undergo. As the physical transformation proceeds, spiritual change also occurs. Both are tempered by ongoing experience on the field of battle and the rituals in which the neophyte must participate. The nature of such rites varies enormously from one chapter to the next. Some are solemn affairs recalling the sacrifice the emperor made for humanity. Others are raucous celebrations drawing on the culture and nature of the chapter's homeworld. Still more are bloody and barbaric involving ritual bloodletting, scarification, or amputation. All are vital to the arcane workings of the chapter, and his participation is a prerequisite of the neophyte's acceptance by his would-be brothers-in-arms. Such are the rigors of the training that many do not survive. Whether he is crippled upon the battlefield or found spiritually wanting during a particularly exacting ritual, a neophyte may find himself cast out, his future with the chapter curtailed. In some instances, the neophyte may transgress one of the many articles of chapter law, and injury at war may prove preferable to the punishment. Many possible fates await those who fall by the wayside in this manner. Most are mind-scrubbed and become chapter serfs, manservants, and menials. The less fortunate are transformed into living, cybernetic servitors, mindless biomechanical automatons who exist only to assist the chapter's tech marines in the operation of heavy and frequently dangerous machinery. A very rare few may yet rise to positions of relative power within the chapter's feudal household, yet even the highest-ranked factotum is but a lowly, nameless servant in the eyes of the full battle brothers. The worlds that the space marines recruit from often have a wide range of legends regarding the Adeptus Astartes. As many of the communities in question are primitive or barbaric, the people regard the space marines as otherworldly figures, angels of death who arrive once in a generation to test them and carry away their strongest sons. On more advanced worlds, the people will have more of an understanding of who and what the Adeptus Astartes are and regard the success of an aspirant as an honor to the entire community. On some worlds, the knowledge that a distant ancestor was recruited into the Astartes is as good as a patent of nobility and portraits of the legendary hero adorn the walls and prayers are said to him as if he were a saint of the imperial cult in times of need. 